welcome to you, your Covidence UK webinar for August 2021. Uh, my name is Adrian Martineau. I'm the Chief Investigator for the study based at Queen Mary University of London. So in today's webinar, we have two items. The first is an update on the progress we've made with the post-vaccination antibody study, where I'll be sharing results of early analyses. And the second is a discussion of the contribution which uh, genetic research can make to COVID-19. And I'll be introducing uh, Dr. Patrick Short from Sano Genetics, with whom we are collaborating to do some genetic studies in the future. So how are we getting on with the post-vaccination antibody study? Well, I'm pleased to say that uh, around 13,000 of you have now signed up to take part in the study, which is really fantastic uh, effort and interest. So thank you very much for doing so. Um, around 8,000 of you have now sent back your dried blood spots, which we've uh, logged and sent off to the lab in Birmingham. Uh, and we now have results back from that lab for 1,742 people who are contributing to the analysis I'm going to present today. And of those, um, just under half had two doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, just over half had two doses of the Pfizer vaccine, and 21 had some other regimen, be it uh, a mixture of those two or an alternative uh, vaccination such as Novavax, Moderna uh, or Sinovac. Now the post-vaccination blood spots were done uh, at a minimum of eight days after the second dose of vaccination and a maximum of 166 days after the second dose of vaccination. So the first question we wanted to ask was uh, whether or not previous SARS-CoV-2 infection uh, might affect antibody responses to vaccination. What you can see here is a scatter plot showing antibody levels on the y-axis, that's the vertical axis, and presence or absence of previous SARS-CoV-2 infection, that's COVID-19, prior to the first dose of uh, vaccination, uh, with those who've, who did have disease before vaccination on the left, and those who didn't have vac disease prior to vaccination on the right. And what you can see is that antibody levels are statistically significantly higher among those who had prior COVID-19 and then had a vaccine compared to those who didn't, who were then vaccinated. Not only that, uh, but you can also see that the number of people who have uh, undetectable levels, that is levels less than one on this scale, is much smaller for those who had previous COVID-19 than those who didn't. Now, you'll probably be interested to know whether or not the vaccine type makes a difference. And we restricted this analysis just to people who'd had two doses of Pfizer or two doses of AstraZeneca. What you can see here is that the median uh, level, that's the level in the middle of antibodies uh, for people who had two doses of AstraZeneca, was somewhat lower than it was for people who'd had two doses of Pfizer. However, what we're really interested in is not the average level, because basically anybody above that dotted line should have a good degree of protection. What we're interested in is the proportion of people who have antibodies that are below that dotted line that may not offer protection. When we look at that proportion, we can see that uh, around 5.6% of people who'd had two doses of AstraZeneca uh, didn't have detectable antibody thereafter with our test, uh, compared to 1.2% of those who'd had two doses of Pfizer. Now, one of the reasons for this, of course, is that we might have sampled uh, people late after vaccination and that their vaccine was, their response to vaccine had waned, and these are the people who've got the undetectable vaccine. So what do we know about the time course of the response to vaccine? Well, here again, we're comparing AstraZeneca on the left with Pfizer on the right. And again, the antibody level is on the y-axis or the vertical axis with the number of days after the second dose of vaccine on the x-axis or the horizontal axis. And you can see that for both vaccines, the line of best fit, which is this solid line, uh, does point slope downwards to the right over time, showing that, as we expect, antibody uh, responses decline over time with both uh, following both vaccinations. But you can see that the slope on the AstraZeneca is somewhat steeper than the slope on the Pfizer, suggesting that the rate of decline in antibody TETA for people who had two doses of AstraZeneca is uh, perhaps uh, somewhat faster than that for two doses of Pfizer. The important point to bear in mind, though, is that it's really only a small minority of people who uh, actually develop antibody levels which are less than the detectable threshold uh, of one here under the dotted line. So where are we going next? I think the first thing to say is that we need to await further results. This is just from less than 2,000 results, and we're expecting 13,000 ultimately. So we'll have much more statistical power to look at a number of other more detailed questions. And those questions are firstly going to ask whether or not low antibodies do indeed indicate increased risk of post-vaccination 
uh, COVID-19. And it's not necessarily the case because, as I've mentioned in previous webinars, antibody responses are only just part of the picture. We know that T cell responses, which are not measured by our test, can also be important protection. We know that they're stimulated by vaccines and we know that some people can have a T cell response in the absence of an antibody response. And indeed, we're doing a sub-study in around 160 people looking at T cell responses as well as antibody responses. We're unable to do them on the same scale as the antibody tests because they require a fresh blood sample. So I'm hoping to be able to share those results with you in the next month or two. But another fact, another question we can ask is what are the risk factors for having a weaker antibody response? Um, could it be associated with underlying conditions, for example, uh, people who are known to have um, uh, issues with uh, immune function? Could it be due to people who are on immunosuppressant medication, for example, chemotherapy for cancer or steroids for asthma or uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease? Could it be to do with lifestyle? Could smoking, alcohol, vaping, exercise, sleep, stress, any of those affect? Uh, we'll know all of this because of the very detailed information you've given us from your questionnaires, which we can then apply to this analysis to see whether these factors can affect vaccination response. Could it be that the reason that some people, that a higher proportion of people are not responding to AstraZeneca compared to Pfizer might represent a, a partial immunity to the vector? We know that AstraZeneca is a live vaccine, the, uh, the vaccine piggybacks onto uh, a, a vaccine vector, whereas Pfizer is an RNA vaccine. So that's one of the possibilities we're looking at with the immunology lab in Birmingham. And then a final possibility could be that for a small proportion of the people who don't have a, response, a good response to the vaccine, they may have some genetic factors which could explain it. And that brings me neatly actually into the second section of the webinar, which is uh, really a, a brief discussion of what we can learn from genetic studies in COVID-19. I'm delighted to say we've got uh, Dr. Patrick Short, who's the CEO of uh, Sano Genetics, an organization that runs uh, genetic research studies in COVID-19 and other conditions. And uh, Patrick's uh, here with me now. Um, Patrick, are you there? I am, thanks Adrian, great update and good to be here. Great, well, thanks very much for uh, joining us today. Um, Patrick, just to get the ball rolling, um, COVID-19 UK so far has focused on what we call modifiable risk factors for COVID-19, the sort of things that we can change. But genetics is different, isn't it? And can you tell us what genetic studies are and what they can tell us about COVID-19? Yeah, definitely. I think broadly speaking, there's two main things that genetics can teach us in COVID-19 and, and in other diseases. One of them is fairly obvious um, and the other one is, is maybe less obvious. So if we start with the one that's probably pretty obvious to most people is genetic studies can tell us whether there are certain people who are at higher or lower risk of developing a disease like cystic fibrosis or Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's or COVID-19 uh, for some genetic factor. And uh, you know that, that's one of the main reasons why genetic studies are run. The second reason, which is maybe a little bit less obvious, is that the genetic studies can also tell us something very fundamental about biology and what's actually happening under the hood, so to speak, um, that causes people to be at either higher risk or lower risk. So to give a non-COVID-19 example, um, there's a famous example of a gene called PCSK9, where it was discovered that people who had this gene naturally knocked out had much lower levels of cholesterol and therefore lower degrees of heart disease. So what this gave a really interesting insight into the fundamental biology that this gene, PCSK9, was involved in cholesterol and, and a heart risk factor. And going a step beyond that, um, it enabled scientists to design drugs that target that gene or that protein and then can knock cholesterol down in everyone else. So applying the same logic to COVID-19, the, the thought process is if we can identify genetic variants that increase risk of severe COVID-19 or, or susceptibility to an infection in the first place, that could A, help us to pinpoint people who are at higher risk and, and do something to lower that risk. And the second might actually lead to drug targets, new ways of developing therapies by learning something about the underlying biology. That's fantastic. Thanks for that very clear explanation. Now, um, you're planning to do a study in long COVID, am I right? And uh, I think there could be potential for uh, participants in COVID in UK to get involved if they're interested. So could you tell us a little bit about that study? Yes, that's right. So we at Sano, we are a company that has developed a platform for both online and at home genetic testing studies. And one of the things that we realized pretty early on in the pandemic was that there were a lot of genetic studies that were happening in severe and hospitalized COVID patients. 
blood could be drawn in the ICU and genetic studies could be done to understand whether there were genetic factors that made um, people more likely to be hospitalized, put on a ventilator, et cetera. But there was a large group of people, in particular those with long COVID, that may have gone to the hospital and, and left, or in most cases, maybe not even gone to the hospital at all, but were suffering very severe symptoms. So uh, we've been working together with a number of different groups, primarily uh, Dr. David Strain, who's at the University of Exeter and leads the long COVID clinic there and is on a number of groups nationwide to do a fully online and at home genetic study in people with long COVID. So uh, our plan, and we've got funding and ethical approval to genetically test 2,000 people who have long COVID and at least 1,000 people who are healthy or have not gone on to develop long COVID. And the reason for the two different groups is, is to compare the genetic signals between people who have uh, gone on to been infected and got on to develop long COVID versus people who uh, have been infected and have actually not gone on to develop long COVID. So we can compare to see if there are any genetic signals that are in one group rather than the other. Okay, so just to be clear then, this study is going to be focused on people who've had proven or suspected COVID-19 and you're interested in two groups, one group who had infection who didn't get long COVID and the other group who had infection who did get long COVID. That's right. And we're not being um, incredibly prescriptive about you having to have had a PCR test because we know early in the um, in the pandemic, there were many people who didn't get tested. So uh, whether you're long COVID or otherwise, if, you, if there's a strong suspicion that you actually had COVID-19 because a doctor told you that you likely did or you had a later antibody test, um, all the information is captured through a survey so we can understand who received a PCR test, who didn't, who's received antibody tests, et cetera. But yes, you're exactly right. So it's open to anyone who's been affected, whether they've had long COVID or or recovered relatively quickly. Okay, that's great. So um, I think the plan then is in the next couple of weeks, uh, we'll be um, identifying people within the cohort who've had COVID, both those who haven't developed long COVID and those who have. Uh, and then we'll be able to send them a bit of information about the study um, and they can read more and decide if they want to sign up. Great. Yeah. And I, I can actually show you one of our. Um, so if people do decide to take part, they'll get one of our test kits in the mail. So these are basically saliva based kits. You uh, spit in the tube, send it back. It's very easy to do. But yeah, like you said, Adrian, it's um, completely optional. I think you'll get information. You can read the website, decide if you'd like to take part and uh, and learn more. That's fantastic. Well, thanks for making time to talk to us today, Patrick, and uh, we're really looking forward to uh, working together in the months ahead to try and uh, crack some the trickier questions around COVID-19. Absolutely. My pleasure and great update. It's really great the way you are um, keeping everybody up to date on the progress here. Fantastic. So uh, I'm just going to draw things to a close now. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Thanks very much for all your efforts continuing to complete our questionnaires. Um, that information continues to be super valuable, uh, particularly now that we have antibody data we can link to see whether or not that can predict uh, whether or not anybody gets uh, COVID-19 after uh, vaccination. So uh, for now, it's uh, goodbye from me and all the team until next month. Goodbye. <laughs>